Hey, Pastor Josh here. Thanks for tuning into Praxis Church. We hope this content blesses you and helps you grow in your knowledge and discipleship journey to Jesus. If Praxis isn't home for you, we want to encourage you to find a local church to get connected to. We believe that's an absolutely essential component of being a disciple of Jesus. But if there isn't a great Bible teaching, gospel proclaiming church near you, we'd love Praxis to become home wherever you're tuning in from. And, and perhaps you'd be interested in starting a Praxis anywhere campus right in your community. You can do this from your living room. We'll send you sermon series books, some additional study content and group discussion questions that link together with the sermons so that you and perhaps others in your community can start a Christian community right where you are. Two last things before we begin. Please leave a comment. Um, let us know where you're listening from. We'd love to know. And if this content blesses you and, and you'd like to give towards the mission of Praxis, you can do so at praxischurch.ca. Well, good morning. How's everyone? Good, if I haven't met you before, my name is Josh. I'm the pastor here at Praxis. Big warm welcome to you, first time guests and visitors. We're gonna start our gathering the same way we do every week. I'm gonna invite you to stand and we're gonna pray for a different nation of the world. We do this because Jesus commanded us to. He said, um, pray to the Lord of the harvest that he would send laborers into the harvest for the harvest is plentiful, but the laborers are few. And this morning we're praying for the country of Burkina Faso, which is kind of on the, the west coast, a little inland of Africa, um, big country, little over half of it is Muslim, 25 unreached people groups, I believe, in this country, which makes up 5.5 million people. And we pray because Jesus gave us this assurance that um, ever, he says the gospel will go to all nations and then the end will come. And so we're to pray to this end and we're to live our lives to this end. Some of us by going, um, other, we'll pray for laborers, but that, that is a possibility. The Lord would call some of us here to be part of the work that he's doing around the world. And so if you would practice, join with me and I will open us in a word of prayer. Father, I'm, I'm thankful for a chance to gather here to, to reflect back, come out of our weeks and reflect back on the glorious truth of your son and all that's been accomplished for us in the death and resurrection of Christ. But we're mindful of our brothers and sisters around the world. I think of our brothers and sisters in Burkina Faso who are facing uh, their, their churches being burned down, persecution for coming to faith. And we think of those 5.5 million people who are unreached, who don't have access to the gospel. I pray you would raise up laborers for that harvest. And I pray even from our own mix, we would become a church that is part Part of this work that you're doing around the world. And so stir, call, call ourselves. We offer ourselves up to you for the service of, of proclaiming the gospel. And we ask this morning as we gather, as we direct our praise back up to you, that our hearts would be full, our minds would be um, um, filled with this vision of, of Christ. And we pray that you would be glorified. We pray in the great name of Jesus. Amen. I'm going to open us with a little reading from Philippians 4. It says this. It says, Rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I say, rejoice. The Lord is at hand, so don't be anxious about anything, but in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God, and the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. Church, let's sing now.
still turning tragedy to triumph turning agony to praise there is blessing in the battle so take heart and stand amazed rejoice when you cry to him he hears your voice he will wipe away your fears rejoice Sing, you give life. You give life. You are love. You bring light to the darkness. You give hope. You restore every heart that is broken. Great.
says, Behold, God is my salvation. I will trust and not be afraid. For the Lord God is my strength and my song, and he has become my salvation. Join us as we sing and reflect on the good news that is the gospel.
Lord Jesus, thank you for the work you've done for us on the cross and continue to do in our lives. We desire for our trust to remain in you alone and depend on you in all areas of our life. Help us to trust you in every way. Amen. Now you can go ahead and grab your Bibles and your notebooks as we continue to study uh, the Gospel of Mark. How's everybody? Good to see you, Jace. Um, welcome. If you're a first time guest or visitor or I haven't met you before, my name's Josh. Big warm welcome to you, first time guests and visitors on behalf of the, the staff and the eldership. Um, we're honored that you're here with us. Hopefully you received one of our Mark books on the way in. If you didn't, just go ahead, put your hands up. Our, one of our ushers will bring one down to you. And because, uh, uh, yeah, helpful guide if you want to study through Mark on your own or take some notes, um, this is our gift to you. Uh, while that's taking place, a couple announcements. I mentioned last week, our community groups are wrapping up this week. Uh, our regular rhythm is we gather here on Sundays and then we scatter into community groups around the city. Uh, this is gonna pause for the summer months, but community isn't. We actually have a whole bunch of different events coming up uh, all throughout the coming months. You can go check that out. You can register online. I'm leading a paddling event this weekend. And if you're with us last week, you know um, it's probably going to be an adventure out on the water. And so uh, yeah, go ahead and get registered for those as well. Next Saturday, we have a group called Move In. Move In, um, they're, they're in a number of different Canadian cities. It was started uh, 14 years ago in uh, Toronto by a guy by the name of Nigel Paul. This organization has uh, a vision to see Christians intentionally move into lower income, higher density neighborhoods in order to bring the gospel to bear. Because this is usually where um, marginalized people are living as well as people new to the country. And um, we have unreached people groups right in our own midst. It's a fantastic organization. And next Saturday from 10 to one, they're gonna be doing a four kilometer prayer walk and just praying, how would the Lord move? And would he perhaps call some of us to, to view living here in Kelowna as, as a missionary assignment and choose where we live, not based off of what amenities we can get, but where there's a gospel need. Fantastic organization. A dear old friend of mine from Vancouver is coming up. He's been with them for years. And um, Laura, who attends Praxis, she's going to be at the Connect desk with some more information on this. I would encourage you. It's just a good thing to go and pray through. Um, and yeah, that's coming up this Saturday. And actually, my paddling events later in the day, so you can still do both. If you, if you want. As well, we have a baptism class coming up on June 23rd. That's because literally every week people have been coming to faith. The Spirit of God's moving in some really mighty ways here in Kelowna right now. And if you are new, you've come to faith, you've not yet been baptized, you need to be because this is really one of the first steps of obedience we take in our discipleship journey with Jesus. And so even if it's just by way of gaining some more information, would you go online, register for that if you're not baptized? And then I believe it's July 7th, we're gonna be doing baptisms in the lake. Lastly, um, the baby bottles that we handed out for Okanagan Valley Crisis Pregnancy Center on Mother's Day, they're due back next week for Father's Day. So um, shove some cash in them, bring them back next Sunday and we'll bless that organization. <coughs> Pardon me. <coughs> we left off last week with Jesus taking his disciples out, the end of Mark 4, on a boat journey that went a little sideways. Today we're picking up that very same story. Um, this is part two of that boat journey, uh, where it's going to be the account of what happened after Jesus calmed the storm. Uh, and uh, so if you haven't already, go ahead, open your Bibles up to Mark chapter 5. If you don't have a Bible with you, you can open your phone, type this in, Mark 5, and these three letters, ESV, and you'll be in the same translation um, that we're using, um, or feel free to use whatever translation you want. While you open your Bibles up, I'm going to open us in a word of prayer. 
Father God, we come before you and I thank you that you, the God of the universe, sent your son to die in our place. That redemption, forgiveness, um, new life is available um, through the person of Christ. And we thank you that you, the God of the universe, also spoke through men as they were carried along by the Holy Spirit. And you've preserved your word for us that we might be built up, equipped, and, uh, and, and lacking in nothing. And we just pray that as we go through your word this morning, Holy Spirit, would you ignite it in our minds, that it would be unpacked in our lives, and the whole of our lives would be transformed in light of it. The preaching of this text, I'm dependent on you for. Would you come, make this word come alive in all of our hearts, including mine? I pray, dependent on you, the great name of Jesus. Amen. All right, Matthew, or pardon me, Mark. That'd be a little different. Mark 5, verse 1. So after Jesus calms the storm, speaks to it. Remember, they're freaked out about the storm. He speaks, it calms, they're even more freaked out. Now they get to the other side. They came to the other side of the sea, to the country of the Gerasenes. And when Jesus had stepped out of the boat, immediately there met him out of the tombs, a man with an unclean spirit. So we'll stop right there. Um, it says they came to the other side. And if you were with us last week, I said they'd crossed the Sea of Galilee, about a 10 kilometer, 12 kilometer wide body of water. And they were crossing over to the the other side, the country of the Gerasenes, the text says, and if you are with us last week, I talked about how that's a Roman territory. They've headed across, and when they get there, the text says immediately there met them a man from out of the tombs with an unclean spirit. Now, this is significant because as we read through the 20 verses we're going to chip away at today, what we'll see is that right after he meets this man, he gets back in the water and crosses back over to the other side. So, they're going here for something. The question is, what, what is it? What, what was worth weathering this storm for? What's on the other side that was worth this big, treacherous journey? I think it's this encounter. So this is why they're crossing. Now, the disciples might have got to the other side. You remember, Jesus took a nap, but they didn't. So I think they're probably thinking as they get to the other side, well, great, it's time to kick up our feet, have a falafel sandwich, and maybe it's our chance to take a nap, Jesus. But the boat gets there, and immediately there's this man. They might think the object lesson is over. I think it's continuing on here. I mentioned last week about how this, the other side of the Sea of Galilee here is a, a Roman territory made up of 10 cities at this time, often referred to as the Decapolis. Um, so they, they've come to a city. We need to know that. And for the Bible nerds in the room, if you've read through the Sermon on the Mount ever, Jesus in there, he says, um, you're the light of the world. A city set on a hill cannot be hidden. This is kind of interesting, fun fact, um, if you're ever playing Bibleopoly. Um, this side is this Roman Decapolis, a city up on the hill. On the other side is a city named, or an area called Capernaum, where Jesus actually taught the Sermon on the Mount. So from where Jesus taught the Sermon on the Mount and said a city on the hill can't be hidden, they would have actually been looking across at this city, the Decapolis. It was visible all throughout the region. And there's some irony here, though, in that the demoniac is actually up on this hill. This demon-possessed man, is, he's up on this hill, and just as this light from a city on a hill couldn't be hidden from the other side, as Jesus comes across the water, so too can the light of the world, Jesus, not be hidden from the demoniac who's up on this hill. I found that interesting. Verse 6, um, it says this demon saw Jesus coming from afar, and, and he ran and fell down before him, um, he saw him as he was crossing the lake. This, the demonic realm knew full well the one that they were subject to, the one who was more powerful than them, was coming across the lake. Perhaps they kicked up the storm. I don't know. But they, they, they saw the storm come up. They knew Jesus was coming. They saw the storm quelled perfectly, the, the water stilled, and and. As Jesus comes and, and he arrives at the shore, it says immediately this demon-possessed man came down and met him. Saw him coming. Verse 3 uh, tells us a little bit more about the man too. It says, <clears throat> he lived amongst the tombs. And no one, so there's tombs just on the outskirts of this city. 
No one could bind him anymore, not even with a chain, for he'd often been bound with shackles and chains, but he wrenched the chains apart and he broke the shackles in pieces. No one had the strength to subdue him. This guy is, is literally living in the tombs of dead people. And, yeah, and, and remember, Jesus is rolling with a Jewish crowd, right? Jewish crowd. And to them, this would have been the most unholy, unclean person they could think of. One, this guy isn't Jewish, so he's already unclean. He's a Gentile. But their law has this rule that, you know, if you come into contact with tombs or a dead person, you need to go through a whole purification process in order to be able to become clean. And if you haven't, you're to be pushed out from society entirely. And so these Jewish guys go across the water. They come across this guy who would have just been to them the epitome of unclean. Like if we came across somebody with Ebola or you know, smallpox or three years ago, covid this guy is the most ceremonially unclean person imaginable to the Jewish mind. He is. We learn something about this man here, but we also learn some things about demons and about the strategy of Satan in this text. Here, I think what we're seeing is just an age old strategy um, put on display for, for, for us. And I say that because the enemy often tries to do this. He tries to get us away from Christian community and off on our own. The enemy will try to do this. He, he, this is his MO. He will try to do it to you. We need to watch out for it. He, he'll try to get us away from the influence of God's word, God's people. And when we're all alone, we're, we're right where he wants us. First Peter um, 5.8, it says this to us, be sober-minded, like think correctly, be watchful. Your adversary, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion seeking someone to devour. Anyone here, you've seen a lion kill before, either in person or like Nat Geo? How do they do it? They hunt in a pack and they try to get one of the gazelles away from the rest of the pack where they're susceptible. This is the strategy of the enemy. He tries to get us alone so he can get us. This man's all alone. He's completely overcome to the point where the text says no one could bind him anymore. It said they had bound him in shackles and chains, but he broke out of them. Take a look at verse four. He'd often been bound but he broke the shackles in pieces. What we're seeing here is something. Satan and, and sin, they are a force that we will not overpower. The demonic realm is far more powerful than we realize. No chain is going to restrain it. No, we can't come up with chains of moral platitudes, behavioral modification shackles. It's not going to overcome it. The man couldn't overcome it alone, not even with a little help from his friends who show up and try to do this. It's not working. You and your accountability group will not overpower your sin together. You can't do it. We need Jesus. Back to how the enemy works, though. Take a look at verse 5. It says, Night and day among the tombs and on the mountains, he was always crying out and cutting himself with stones. Another strategy of the enemy that I think is being put on display here. He wants to mar the image of God. He, he, this, is his, this is what he's doing all the time. He wants to mar the image of God. He likes to do this in a couple ways. Um, one, just by messing with how we view and understand God. Because if he can get us to understand God correctly, it, he, can, he can draw us away. He, he wants to mar the image of God, even just by how we think of him. This is why bad theology is so dangerous. But he's also not just trying to mar our image of God, he's trying to mar the image of God. You and I, we're, we're made in the image of God. And so if he can get us to destroy ourselves, sabotage ourselves, he, this is a strike at God. It's not a personal thing. This is him attacking God by way of his image bearers on earth. These are two pages out of his playbook here. Distort God's image, destroy God's image. And that's what's happening to this man here. The man is in anguish. He's despairing life. He is cutting himself with stones. He's cutting. He hates himself. He's overrun with sick and wickedness. He's maybe just hating 
all this sin within himself. He's depressed, he's empty, he's unfulfilled, he's despairing even life himself, so he's cutting himself. This is going on modernly too. Unfortunately, this, this idea of cutting has come into the cultural um, language far too much. We hear about it far too much, don't we? We need to see this is a demonic thing. It's a demonic thing. It's not a new idea. It's an ancient and a demonic one. Actually, if you rewind even further in the Bible, there's a story in, um, in, the, in the Kings, I believe Second Kings, about Elijah on Mount Carmel, and he's up against the priests of Baal. And if you remember, the priests of Baal are cutting themselves in order to get their God's attention because this is a demonic act. This is a demonic act that the enemy likes to tell us will accomplish something when in fact all that it's doing is marring the image of God. It's accomplishing Satan's plan. John 10.10, it tells us the thief, Satan and his demons come only to steal and kill and destroy. That's what they're doing. That's their MO. Jesus came that we might have life and life more abundantly. And that word life is actually Greek word zoe, which means like new life, life as Christ himself had it. He came to give us new life. Satan came to kill and destroy. When the man saw Jesus from afar, he ran and fell down before him. And crying out with a loud voice, he said, what have you to do with me, Jesus, son of the most high God? Um, this is, the demon speaking, it's really actually interesting. If you go back through Mark's gospel, the only people to have recognized Jesus for who he is has been demons so far. And, and, and that's because, uh, well, we'll get into it in a minute, but the, 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 they, they've known Jesus before he incarnated. They knew him. Before they were thrown down from heaven, they knew him. They know who he is. He shows up. It's a little bit before the time so they're going, why have you come? Why, why are you here? What have you to do with me? I adjure you, don't torment me, they say. I, I like Matthew's gospel records the same um, story and it adds this detail. It, tells, uh, it says that the demons were saying, have you come to throw us into the abyss? The abyss being the holding place for Satan and his demons up until the time of judgment. They're running amok and they're saying, don't send us there. Don't send us there. And so Jesus asked them, um, what is your name? And he replied, my name is Legion for we are many. Really interesting wordplay going on in here too on your own time. You could dive into this, but you take a look at the pronouns in Mark and they bounce between first person and third person. The demons like to use third person pronouns for themselves. And the man at some points identifies as himself and sometimes identifies as the demons. We studied that in community groups this week, but I, I wanna draw our attention to something here that we can easily miss. And in order to catch it, we need to put ourselves in the shoes of the original first century Jewish audience here. These guys, they've been waiting on the Messiah to come and um, they think he's gonna come and he's gonna do away with Rome who's presently occupying them. They want Rome gone. And so um, they think our big issue, the big um, thing that we're up against is Rome has conquered Jerusalem and we can't do our Jewish thing like we want to. So we need them gone. And so when Jesus takes them in the boat and they start going across to this Jewish side of um, Lake um, Tiberias or the Sea of Galilee, I think this is what they think is going on. They think Jesus is taking us across we're going to go to the other side. Jesus is going to stick it to Rome. Jesus takes them in the boat and, and into the Decapolis, which is Roman territory. So now with that kind of mindset in mind, just take a look at verse 9 again with me. Jesus asked the man, what is your name? He replied, my name is Legion, for we are many. First, third person, back and forth there. Now, some have understood this to mean that you need to ask demons their name when you're exercising them. So you need to know their name, kind of like when you'd get in trouble with your mama and she'd call you by your first, middle, and last name, you know, and you knew you were in real trouble. People will think, hey, you got to get the demon's name so you can say, you know, spirit of gluttony, I defy thee in the name of Jesus. 
demon of alcoholism, I rebuke you, I bind you up, and then you pray the shrub of protection around, and, or the hedge of protection, and the shrubbery, just, just for safety measure as well. But I don't think that's what's going on here. I don't think that's what's going on. I don't think this is how to exercise a demon 101. Because Jesus didn't need to know the demon's name, did he? He already knew it, right? Because he's all-knowing, right? Furthermore, Jesus made this demon, didn't he? Now that's a stick in the spokes of a couple people's worldview because many of us actually believe a form of um, Eastern dualism. Eastern dualism, this idea that there's eternally existed good and evil and they're kind of battling like we've seen in Looney Tunes. Unfortunately, the Bible doesn't teach this worldview. It actually says God created angels the angels rebelled and were thrown down. You can go read about this in Revelation 12. So this demon was an angel that was actually made by God, Jesus being the second person of the eternal triune God, right? So Jesus didn't need to know his name. Why is he asking it? I think it's for the benefit of the disciples. Let me get nerdy with you. What did the, the demon say his name was again? Legion. A legion was a, a unit of Roman soldiers, 6,000 soldiers, in fact. So when most people hear this name, they would say, well, there's 6,000 demons in this man, approximately. And then when they later on spread into the pigs, they go three, three per pig, something like that. I'm not denying there's lots of demons here, but I think that there's more. Rome would put a legion of soldiers in a place when they wanted to, to claim dominion over it, exercise authority over something, because if you've watched 300 and what 300 Roman soldiers can do, 6,000 is quite a lethal force. Nobody's overthrowing a placement of 6,000 lethally trained Roman soldiers. And actually, if you go to Jerusalem, um, the original um, temple Right nearby it was a Roman fort called Fort Antonio, and right here was stationed an entire legion of Roman soldiers. And so Jews, as they came up through the East Gate for um, worship, they would be reminded. They would see even higher than the Temple Mount, um, this Fort Antonia. And, and soldiers everywhere, the, the soldiers that made up this legion all throughout the streets, They'd be reminded every time they went to worship of the Roman army that dominated them. Now, so when I see the demon identify himself as legion, I think it's illustrating something deeper, a deeper reality. I think what it's saying is that the thing that they're in bondage to isn't actually Rome. It's not the legion of soldiers. It's Satan and his army. The problem isn't Rome, it's Satan. The problem isn't physical, it's spiritual and it's demonic. When, when the demon refers to himself as, as a, a legion, I think this is probably just, it's setting off alarm bells in the Jewish minds of the time. It's like Jesus is saying, what you think you're in bondage to, it's not actually that. And he's showing it through the object lesson of this demon-possessed man. Furthermore, guess what the emblem was on, on the shield and the flag of this Roman legion that was stationed in Jerusalem? It was a pig. Now for some, okay, you're making that connection. Some of you just hold on to that idea. We'll come back and you're going to go. Pshaw. The legionary emblem was a pig. And so I, I think this legion is more than just the name that the demon is going by. I think the term legion is actually making a bigger connection. It's revealing a spiritual reality behind the physical one. It's like Jesus took them across the sea to pull back the curtain and let them see behind it. He's teaching them lessons about the kingdom of God that has come, and he's taken them here to pull back the curtain and show them that there's spiritual realities behind many of the physical ones that we face. I think we have the propensity to, to lose sight of this as well. Actually, we see this in elsewhere. Matthew 17, there's a story about an um, um, epileptic boy being brought to Jesus, and the way that this boy is healed is a demon comes out of him. Now, I'm not saying everyone who has Epilepsy has a demon, but it could be, because the scripture shows us this. Some of the physical realities we face are actually demonic, because there's a spiritual reality and a physical one. 
And I think much of this goes on today. Much of what we face has behind it dark spiritual forces as well. Spiritual realities behind the physical ones. I think demons have infiltrated Western culture at every level, from politics to education, through to spirituality in all forms. Just, it's all over the place, and we're blinded to it because as Christians, we've bought into this per, you know, the pervasive cultural worldview that all there is is, is the physical. We're, it's just natural. We're just space dust colliding with space dust, big walking, talking bags of biological goo, the great, 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 great grandbabies of bluefin tuna. That's what we're taught. There's, we're nothing more than material. But the problem, again, is the biblical worldview says this is garbage. Yes, we're made from dust and we're physical, but God actually breathed his spirit into us, and we are both simultaneously spirit and physical beings. This is how God designed us. But we lose sight of it. We try to explain it away and understand the world just through the physical world world. And I think, if you've ever heard this quote, the greatest uh, trick the devil ever pulled was convincing people he didn't exist. I think he's convinced the Western church. We've lost sight of it. We're, we're fighting all of our battles physically and forgetting there's spiritual realities going on behind this. And Jesus takes his disciples across the sea to, to teach them this important lesson. He's teaching them about the kingdom of God and showing them that it's not just a physical reality. There's a spiritual one. There are spiritual forces of evil corrupting God's design. And in order for the kingdom of God to fully unpack, the people of God need to recognize these spiritual forces at work in our world. Our, our culture, again, it tends to think that there's just nothing more than material. We're materialist. We're enlightened. It tends to think of itself as non-religious, godless, but many of these, I think these ancient demons are still at work in our culture today. I'll give you a couple examples. I already mentioned Baal, but in ancient times, Baal was worshipped for wealth and power. And, and they would sacrifice their children to Baal in order to get wealth and power. Now, most people don't worship Baal directly, right? Unless you believe in, or you know about the Garden Grove in California. Anyone? Okay. Okay. Um, most people don't worship Baal directly. But the lust for money and power carries on today and many people still sacrifice their children for it, don't they? Not having kids so they can have more of a career and more money. Or aborting their children so that they can have more of a career and a better life than they want. It's the same thing. I'll give you another example. Ishtar, anciently, the goddess of um, power and, and, and love, and people would sacrifice themselves to her through performing sexual acts as prostitutes in her temple. Now, it might not seem like that goes on today, um, but then you're probably not on social media. Because there are countless people disrobing, not just online, but in person, in order to get power, be that social rank, um, whatever it might be, more wealth. Solomon said, there's nothing new under the sun. There's just old demons and new clothes. Old demons at play in a culture that doesn't believe there's any spiritual world. Ephesians tells us this, though. We are not fighting against flesh and blood enemies, but against evil rulers and authorities of the unseen world, against mighty powers in this dark world, and against evil spirits in the heavenly places. There's more going on behind the curtain than we realize. Many of, much of this ancient worship continues on today, dark spiritual realities behind much of what is physical. Here's where I'm going with this. Many of us were, were battling against physical things, situations, our oppressors, the things that we feel have dominated us, and it's not physical in its origin, it's actually spiritual. We need to see this behind many of the things that we're encountering in our life. There are dark, demonic, spiritual forces, and the way that we will conquer them is not through physical means. I, I did a, a survey on the streets a few years ago, and I walked around and I asked people what they thought their great oppressor was. Like, what's the great thing that you're up against? What are you in bondage to? And I got a variety of different answers. It was a fun afternoon surveying people. I'd get answers from like, I'm in bondage to my mortgage. 
I'm, I'm in bondage to the nine to five. I'm in bondage to um, this, that, the, the culture, the cost of living. Do you know what nobody said? Nobody said they were in bondage to sin and Satan. The Jews here, they, they think they're in bondage to Rome. And this is why they missed their Messiah. This story is showing us there's, there's actually spiritual things going on in the background, a spiritual force that's going by the same name as the thing they're possessed by, which yeah, I think is why Jesus took them across the sea. And so I think it's as, worth asking ourselves, what is it that we think we're in bondage to? What is it that we think we're oppressed by? In our life, in our, in our, in our culture, what, are, what is the oppressor? I wouldn't be surprised if behind that is not actually a demon going by the same name. Can't help but think that. Jesus takes them across in order to um, reveal a, a misunderstanding, a misunderstanding about what they're in bondage to and a misunderstanding on what they think will get them out of it. And as we read on, we're going to see this misunderstanding about what they would actually free them from this uh, challenged as well. Take a look again at verse three with me. It says, this man lived among the tombs. No one could bind him anymore, not even with a chain. He'd often been bound with shackles and chains, but he wrenched the chains apart and he broke the shackles in pieces. So very powerful uh, truth illustrated in this encounter here. Jesus has taken the disciples across He's pulled back the curtain. He showed them the reality of what's going on behind the scenes, the opposition they're up against. And he's showing them as just as the, the, the Jews weren't able to overthrow Rome and the legion there, so too was this man and the, the community around him not able to overthrow the spiritual forces at work in him. Shackles didn't work. Chains didn't work because physical things can't defeat spiritual realities. When I, when I did that survey on the street, I'd, I'd ask people, hey, what would bring relief from that oppressor? What would free you from that bondage? The answer, essentially, in a bunch of different forms, but at the core of every single answer was this, was money. Because money is the functional savior of our modern age. Money will save us, right? But just as these chains and these shackles wouldn't restrain the spiritual opponent they were actually up against, money will not fix our problem. Money will not fix our problem because the thing that we are in bondage to is actually Satan and sin. I didn't get that response from anyone on the street, but that's the true reality behind everything we're facing in our day and age. Our opponent is a one that's different than I think we, we might see. It's worth asking, what do we think our oppressor is? What are we looking to for relief from that? Maybe a raise, maybe a new position, better job. What do we think is gonna save us? New spouse, a spouse, bigger house. What do you think is gonna free you from your oppression? Hear this. Satan wants to distract us from the one who actually can save us. And he does this by distracting us from the thing that we actually need saving from. He tries to make us misunderstand the nature of what we need saving from so that we won't look to the one who actually can save us from it. We look to dumb things like money. Where text is gonna show us there's only one person who can free us from the bondage that we're in. His name is Jesus. Take a look at verse 10 with me. He begged him earnestly not to send them out of the country the demon. Don't, don't make us go to the abyss yet. Let us run wild a bit longer. Now a great herd of, of pigs were feeding there on the hillside and they begged him saying, send us to the pigs, let us enter them. There's that pig piece from the shield again. So he gave them permission and the unclean spirits came out, entered the pigs and the herd about numbering about 2,000, rushed down the steep bank into the sea and, and drowned. So 
the demons might have thought they were going to avoid the abyss, and they end up getting there. He allows the demons to run, and they immediately rush down the sea, which I think illustrates a couple things. One, the ultimate outcome of what Satan wants to do. He wants to kill and destroy, as we already read in the text. He wants to kill and destroy, just like these pigs experienced. But it also illustrates to us the ultimate faith, fate pardon me, of, of Satan and his demons, its destruction. They beg to go into the pigs. Jesus outfoxes them, and they run to their death. So if we were to boil this all down, there's lots that we've seen here. I'll just try to cook it all down into some rich theological gravy for us, okay? Five things I think we've seen. One, sometimes natural is actually supernatural. Sometimes the thing we're facing actually has spiritual reality behind it. Some of us, we've forgotten that. There, there, there is this bent within Christendom where some people, everything is spiritual, right? It's like, it's the spirit of this, it's the spirit of that, it's the spirit of COVID, it's the spirit of sore ankles. I don't know. Like, everything is hyper-spiritualized. We can fall off the other side of the horse, but I think most of us were over here. Sometimes, you know, people on the... The devil gave me a flat tire. No, no, he didn't. You hit a curb. Let's be real, okay? So there is spiritual evil. There's also natural evil in the world. Romans tells us that the, 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 the creation has been subjected to futility because of sin. So there is just things in the world. It's not demonic. It's just the effects of sin in the world. But there's also demons at work. Going too long here. So sometimes natural, supernatural. Secondly, demons are more powerful than us. We're not going up against them. We don't need to wage holy crusades and try to sniff demons out of every single corner. Actually, there's a story in, um, in Acts 19 where these two men, they go up and they try to rebuke a demon. And I'll just read this from the NIV because it puts it best. It's a little comical. It says, the demon overpowered them and gave them such a beating that they ran out of the house naked and bleeding. Demons are more powerful than us. Third, Demons want to distract us from what we're actually up against. If they can get us to call it natural, they win. They don't need credit. They just don't want us to see behind the curtain. Fourth, demons want to destroy God's image by either making us think incorrectly about God or actually coming and destroying us as image bearers of God. Fifth thing we've learned, we don't need to know demons' names in order to defeat them because there's only one way to defeat a demon. It's not by knowing its name, it's by knowing Jesus. Let's read on and keep seeing what goes on here. So the herdsmen... The owners of these pigs, they, they fled and they told it to the city and the country and the people came to see what it was that had happened. And they came to Jesus and saw the demon-possessed man, the one who had had the legion, sitting there clothed. Now, it's interesting that suddenly he has clothes on, kind of indicating he's naked before. It's running around naked because this is what Satan wants to do, wants to leave us naked and, and wanting Jesus comes and clothes us. Suddenly he's clothed and he's in his right mind and, uh, and, and they were afraid. Those who had seen it described to them what, it, what had happened and what took place with the pigs, and they began to beg Jesus to depart from their region. Interesting, right? It's a, instead of giving them the keys to the city, they're like, get out of town. I don't know, maybe they're part of PETA. Um, hey, you just sent Babe and Miss Piggy down into the water. Get, get out of here. I don't know, but they're angry. Um, they'd rather have a demoniac running around in their town then lose the pigs. Why? Because that's their profit. This is true today too. Many people, you know, they don't want Christ because it's going to cost them. It's going to cost them something now and they're too nearsighted. All they can think about is their dumb pig and they miss the salvation of their souls. The savior of the world is standing in front of them. They're angered over the fact that they lost a herd of animals. Not that animals are not, the pigs are dumb. They're very tasty. Um, it's that they missed Jesus. I offended somebody, but that was going to happen anyway, right? Um, as he was getting into the boat, the man who had been possessed with the demons begged him that he might go with him, but he didn't permit him. He said to him, go home to your friends, tell them how much the Lord has done for you and how he's had mercy on you. And he went away and began to proclaim in the Decapolis how much Jesus had done for him and everyone marveled. 
so much here. So much here that we learn about demons, demonology, Satan. So much we learn about Jesus as well. First, we learn this. Look at, he crosses the sea for one man. This man being oppressed, who'd been pushed out from society, Jesus takes this boat journey in order to come and reach. He leaves the 99. The throngs of people lined up in the shore over at Capernaum to cross over to a side where no one wants him to free the one man who needed him to. He's not concerned about clean and unclean. He's not repulsed by this man. And you need to hear this. If you feel like this man, some in this, your, your life and they might've called you all sorts of names. You might feel haunted by the list of things you've done or that have been done to you, but Jesus does not view you as unclean. He's not afraid of you infecting him. Greater is he. He comes and he overpowers. He came for the hopeless. He came for the unclean. He came for the defiled. He came for the untouchables. The ones that everyone else has said have gone too far. Third thing we learned, Jesus came to save us from our real problem. He didn't come to make us healthy and wealthy and handsome. He came to free us from Satan, sin, and death. The fourth thing we see in this text is Jesus came to liberate the world from Satan's grasp. He came. Doesn't allow the demons to just go about their business somewhere else. He sends them into pigs who plummet them to their, their death or their sentencing in the abyss. He's come to end Satan's rule and inaugurate his kingdom. Something else here, actually, it's not on my list. You can put the fifth point up and I'll give you a four point B. Something else we learn about Jesus in this text. He's Lord. You look down, verse 19 and 20, we see this. Um, Jesus says to him, tell him, go and tell your friends how much the Lord has done for you. That word, really interestingly, I was just reflecting on this in between services. It's the Greek word kurios, kurios. And it's a word used for God. He's saying, tell him how God had mercy on you. Actually, that word he uses for himself as well. That word kurios, it means the one to whom we belong. He comes and he goes, you don't belong to the Roman legion. That legion that's been placed over your life declaring you it, you do not belong to it. You belong to me. Tell and them. Go and tell them, Curios, the one you belong to, the God of the universe has come and you belong to him now. And the fifth thing he tells us, we see about Christ here is that he saved us to send us. Look at verse 19. He tells them, go home to your friends and tell them. Now, it would have been easier to just go with Jesus, be with God, right? It'd be easier for that man. Most days, I just wish God would take me to glory. Just take me home. But he leaves us here. He sends us here. Because if we wake up with breath, there's still a task for us. Jesus tells him to go. It's the same thing that he tells us when we come to him. Go make disciples of all nations. Go tell the good news. Go into the whole world. Go tell every people group. Follow my example of crossing the sea to reach the one. Follow my example of weathering storms to reach the one who needs freeing. Follow me out of your comfort zone into the ones, into the area where you can find those who need deliverance. Come bring hope to those who have none. I think the, the Western church as a whole, we're a little bit guilty of just opening the doors up on Sunday and waiting for people to come. It's like rowing your boat out in the lake, tucking the oars up and waiting for fish to hop in. Just not super effective. Might happen, right? The Lord's been doing it here. <laughs> people walk by and oh, I'm going to go inside. But he calls us to go. We're, we, we're expecting the culture to become missionaries and cross a cultural gap to come and sit in here, which is kind of weird. He's called us to go. We're to go. If you're here and you would not identify as a Christian, I don't believe you're here by coincidence. I don't believe it's a coincidence the storm kicked up in the story from last week. I don't believe it's a coincidence that Jesus comes into contact with this demoniac. I, I believe it's not a coincidence you're here either this morning. In the same way Jesus freed this man 
from the thing that was oppressing him, the bondage that he was in, Christ comes to offer you freedom and deliverance this morning as well. Deliverance from trying to find your pleasure in things that could never ultimately satisfy you. Deliverance from trying to find your purpose in things that will never give it to you. This morning, Jesus says, turn from those things and follow me. That's what repentance means. You've heard that word. It means turn from that and turn to this. Change your thinking about what's actually going to give you life. This path is Satan's strategy to get your mind off the one who you were made for. Jesus comes. He gives you a peek behind the curtain so that you will turn and you will follow him. Satan comes only to steal, kill, and destroy. Jesus said he came that we might have life and have it abundantly, and it comes by following him. And maybe you feel like this man in the story. You're, you're oppressed, you're tormented, you're burdened by your sin. You're, you're free in an earthly sense, but you feel like shackled inside. Just as deliverance came to this man when Jesus arrived on the, the shore of the Gerasene, deliverance will come to you as Jesus arrives at the shore of your heart. And this morning, I just want to invite you to, to, to take this invitation to follow him. And if you're here and you're a believer, it's the exact same invitation because becoming a Christian is the same thing as being a Christian. It's daily recognizing all the ways we turn away, daily repenting and choosing to turn and, and, and chase after Christ and the path of life that he laid out for us. It's the same exact thing. And so if, if you're here and you're a Christian, the call is the same thing. The band's going to come up and, and we're going to respond here in a second. Um, but I want to in, invite you to just consider this call this morning. This hit me pretty close to home um, this morning. I, I got here and I realized I forgot my shirt. I had a shirt on under it, don't worry. But I, I was driving home to get this shirt and I got stopped at a stoplight and I looked over and a man died beside me on the sidewalk. And it hit me. I was sitting there and I was watching this. I didn't continue driving. And I saw these other people start to try to resuscitate him trying to revive him. And it just reminded me of this, is that this is what's awaiting every single one of us. This is Satan's objective, is to get us to destroy our lives, to spend our lives apart from the one we were made for. And we don't know how many days we get. We don't know when that's going to happen. But there's an invitation in Christ to take hold of life today. We might not get tomorrow. It's this gospel that comes into us, transforms us. And it came at a great cost. The salvation of this man in the story, it came by way at a great cost, by way of the death of 2,000 animals, which is great and that's sad. Our salvation, the freedom from our oppressor came at a much greater cost, church. It came at the death of Christ. He came. He was the one who was killed. Instead of us, he took the wrath we deserved. He took all that was oppressing us upon himself in order to free us from it. Salvation will not come by any shackle, by any self-restraint or more discipline, or you just not doing that thing anymore. Salvation comes in one way. It's through Christ dying in your place, taking the punishment you and I deserve, and gifting us the reward that only he did. That's the one path of salvation. There's salvation in no other name. The scripture says there's no other name given amongst men by which men must be saved. There's one name, it's the name Jesus. I wanna invite you to stand. We're gonna have some people serving communion. Bread and wine, which is a picture of the body and blood that Christ gave to purchase this redemption for us. If you're here and you're a Christian, come take the bread, dip it in the wine, and rejoice. Rejoice because Christ has taken that punishment for you. There's salvation regardless of what kind of week you've had, how in bondage you feel to this, whether you're a Christian, not a Christian, there's freedom in Christ. If you're here in a Christian, come take communion. If you're not, stay in your seat and take Jesus. Let me close us in prayer. Father, thank you for your word. Thank you that um, you show us this behind the curtain. We can see the, the dark reality that is oppressing many of us, that is pressing all of us, that is at work behind the scenes, trying to suppress the truth of the gospel. But we stand on this promise. Greater is he who's in the world than he, or greater is he who is in us than he who's in the world. 
the gates of hell will not overcome um, the, the gates of the church, the gates of heaven that you've opened wide in Christ. And we pray this morning, just the truth of this would unpack in our hearts and minds that it would draw some to salvation and those who have come to salvation, it would draw us to joy. We pray in the great name of Jesus for your glory, Father. Amen. Church, come when you're ready and let's sing together.
soul, my Savior God, to Thee. How great Thou art, how great Thou art. respond to how truly great you are. Thank you for sending your son to save us. All honor and glory and praise to you, Lord. In your name, amen. It was so great to worship with you all this morning. Uh, If you haven't filled out a connect card, please do so. You'll also find prayer cards and a give station in the upper foyer um, if you're looking for prayer or a way to support this ministry. Now let me leave you with this benediction. Um, it comes from Hebrews 13, 20 to 21. Um, now may the peace of God who brought again from the dead our Lord Jesus, the great shepherd of the sheep, by the blood of the eternal covenant, equip you with everything good that you may do his will, working in us that which is pleasing in his sight, through Jesus Christ, to whom be glory forever and ever. Amen. Have a great week, Praxis.